Where the where's uh, Benjamin and Oh no no Hey no no they're behind you Okay, the, the next talk is starting now. So the next talk will be about building a simple to use database management tool by Mr. Chinap Chok. Mr. Chinap is the co-founder of Jubilia, Jubilia, which specializes in business matching at events with real-time data analysis. Apart from leading the development team, Chinap works on moonshot ideas that pushes the boundaries of interfacing technology with face-to-face -face interactions. He was born in India and brought up in Indonesia, having a diverse background within Asia. Shinab has graduated from the National University of Singapore with a Bachelor of Engineering with Honours and University Scholarship Program. Outside of the office, Shinab enjoys playing tennis, runs several web projects on the site, and is fascinated by new technology research. So, yeah. Alright, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Hello everyone. Um, so I was at a tech conference about two months back. It was probably one of the biggest I've seen in Singapore, about two to three thousand people. And it was so huge that there was this massive stage and on each side of the stage there was these two screens, the screen you usually see in movie theaters. But there was one thing which was very surprising at the event itself. There were not many people using their laptops. So I don't know whether I was at the right place, but as I've been through many of the talks and I can see some of you guys here, a lot of people are on their laptops. I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but I do feel more at home. So let me start by introducing myself. My name is Chinab. I, as uh, my friend just described, I am the CTO and co-founder of Jubia a three-year-old startup into the business of making meaningful hellos at events. So we make attending conferences very easy because we uh, help arrange relevant one-to-one -one meetings between the participants. This is facilitated through uh, our web application, which you see to the right, which is Jubia Match, and it runs before the event itself, so three to four weeks before the event. In addition to this, we have Jubia Sense, a real-time analytics dashboard shown to my left, which uh, tracks every interaction on the Match platform itself, and we overlap demographic data with networking data coming from Match. And this gives us a lot of uh, real-time and rich insights which can benefit the organizer to improve the networking segment of their events. So we have a small team, but we are Doing about, we have done about 300 events ranging from various industries, about th over 30 different industries around the world. So what brings me here today? We are one of the sponsors. I'm not sure if you guys have seen us. If you have not, come by our booth. And we want to give back to the community because Python is the core of our data analytics dashboard. And it allows us to give us high performance, uh, easy to use data structures and open source data analysis libraries for commonly used functionalities. So using this, um, I hope to inspire you guys on how we use Python to build one of the internal tools and actually one of the most important internal tools in our company to scale up, which we call Data Sync. So as we scale up our business, we need to conceive, build and improve our own internal tools as well. And that is a big component of a SaaS software as a service business like ours. And one of the issues as we were scaling up was data management. We currently get all our data from event organizers, and, which they get, and they get their data from the registration system itself. So they usually pass us this data in the form of Excel sheets. It all sounds simple until you realize we cater for different types of events, handling different types of data itself. And you have different stakeholders at different events, and the events vary in size. We do events which are 200 people and up to 50,000 people in size as well. So let me give you guys an example. A startup conference would bring together startups and VCs and we would facilitate the networking using our application there. So a startup would give us information like their current investment round, 
their annual revenue. And let's contrast this to a medical fair exhibition. Over here, we, the people going to such an event would be mostly exhibitors who are selling um, medical equipment and then of course buyers or retailers. And they would give us a totally different type of information like where they're operating at and what their products comprise of. So how do we handle these different data sets? And to make it even more difficult, organizers pass us data in batches every week. They would pass us new people going to the event, updates to the existing people, and people who have dropped out. So keeping all these in mind and handling up to 30 events a month, we need to have a scalable solution to achieve this whole data management problem. And we decided to use Google Sheets, a perfect mirror image to SQL and a scalable solution to our problem. So a quick show of hands, who has used the Google Sheet API before? Okay, great. That's good. D did you guys try out the new API v4, which was released this month? No, okay. <clears throat> so let me introduce you guys to Data Sync. There's actually an image there which oh, you can't see. Never mind. <coughs> so it's an easy to use data management tool on Google Sheets built to manage different and dynamic data sets. So in addition to keeping the database always in sync with the Google Sheets, we also have to ensure that our products, which is Jubilee Match and Jubilee Sense, are always writing to both the database and sheets. This will ensure that it's a complete cycle and a two-way sync between the database and sheets is established. It's like having a master and slave database. You need to ensure that they're always in sync. Let me remind you guys that the purpose of this talk is not to show you how to use the Google Sheets API because you are all skilled programmers, so you can just use the documentation to try that out yourself. The purpose is to educate you on how we build data sync so you guys, so you all can go back as well and maybe give it a try to let your non-techies manage the data themselves. It could be your internal team data or it could be a client-facing product built on top of Google Sheets. So we will start off by building a two-way sync between the SQL database and a Google Sheets. Following that, I will show you a sneak peek of Jubilee's own data sync itself, and we will leave the best for the last, which is the code snippets from data sync. So let's get started. Uh, for this example, assume I'm a fruit seller, so, and I have a strong online presence. So I built a very simple application. It's a mobile app which just simply connects to my database. It shows all the fruits I have in stock so people can come to the app and order fruits. Simple. What you see here is how I designed my application, but I have to also say that I'm the only techie in the fruit shop. So everyone comes back to me asking me questions like, oh, how do I know which fruits are in stock now? And so on. But I don't, I'm, I'm totally fed up, fed up, or these questions just become irritating after certain times, being the only programmer. So I decided to leverage on Google Sheets to build a two-way sync between Sheets and the database. Uh, as you guys would know, I'm using this for internal data management only. So my staff can insert new fruits quantities when new shipment arrives. And also, the Sheets get automatically updated when someone purchases a particular fruit via the app. So you don't actually have to go back to your database anymore. You can just use your sheets, which is a mirror representation of the database. And I'm going to show you guys how I did that via some code. Okay. So firstly, I have a simple database. Let me bring that up. <coughs> and I So it just has two columns. Uh, there's a table called fruit, the database is apple pie, and the two columns are ID of the fruit and the fruit name itself. Very simple. So what I'm going to do is first I would open up my IPython terminal. Okay, and I will import the functions which I wrote. 
So I wrote some simple wrappers on top of the Google API. And the first step is to create the Google Sheets itself. So for that, I just have to initiate the worksheet. Now, if I print out the sheet ID, the sheet ID would show me the unique key which is given to me by Google, uh, by Google. and this key You know what, it's going to get really hot, so I'm just going to mirror my display. Yeah. So I'm going to open up the Google Docs, which I just created, maybe an incognito tab using special way, and replace the sheet ID with the one I just got. This would require me to log in, um, and the login credentials will be the one provided based on the one I used to create the sheet itself. So I have an email ready for this. And ta-da, I have a very simple sheet created with the two columns I have inside my database. Nothing special over here, so nothing fancy. Now what I'm going to do next is actually copy over the data from my database. You guys saw four fruits. So I'll just run a simple function I wrote, which will copy over the data itself. So this takes all the data from the database and writes it into the Google Docs. And th there we go. We have the four fruits and the four names we have. But this is still not very useful because it's still static data. It comes more handy when there are updates or inserts to the database itself. So say, for example, there's a new fruit which comes in. Let's say tomatoes come in. And I again pass in the sheet ID. So we have a tomato here, and it will be shown inside my database as well, tomato. Now, what I've done so far has just been a one-way sync, meaning I've shown you data from the database being entered into the Google Docs. But let's make this a bit more smarter because as my Google Sheets grows, we don't want to be spending so much time finding the changes itself. So let me add a new column called status, set everything to synced. What I'm doing here is that whenever a value gets changed over here, this value will be changed from synced to not synced. So my backend can know exactly which values have been updated. But if I add a new row, it won't show any value, which means it's a new insert. So I can practically skip all the values which have been synced and only focus on not synced and empty. And for that, I have to be using the Google app script editor, which allows me to write some JavaScript code. And I have it ready here, so I'll just copy paste this. So quickly go through this. What this would do is it allows me to capture every time a cell value has been changed or a, a cell value has been appended or something because an edit message, edit function is triggered and I pass down which row was changed and what, what is the height of the rows and the which change. Because if I change multiple rows at the same time, I need to be capturing for that use case as well. So I simply find out the height. Most cases, it's just one. And if it's synced, I set it to not synced. If it's not synced, I don't do anything. And the default case is I would just set it to not synced. So let me try this. So if, if it's tomato and I notice that I didn't write a caps T, so I can change that. It should change to not synced. And I can add a new fruit as well, say jackfruit. And now to sync these changes, 
I simply have to call a new function which I've written. It's called simple sync. I have to pass in the the cell notation in, in A1 A1 format, which is all these guys here. So it's A2 to C7. And I pass in the sheet ID as well. This should generate a new ID for the jackfruit, and it should make my T capital over here inside my database. And it changes everything back to synced. So let's take a look at the database, and it's done exactly what I wanted to do. So very simple. But again, this is not very exciting still. We can make this even more better by adding in more dynamic data now. So let me go to my database and maybe add another column. Okay. I can just do it from here. And maybe I'll set the default value to null. Zero. Okay, this part's a bit buggy. Okay. Uh, never mind, I'll just skip this part. But what I was doing was I was adding a column called quantity available. And what it allows me to do is I can now show the quantity available on the Google Sheets itself. And once I have the quantity available on the Google Sheets in this column, I can actually plot a chart with name and quantity. And whenever there are changes to the quantity which are triggered by the app itself, <coughs> or when a new shipment comes in, it will actually be captured on the chart. So anyone, it could be a techie or a non-techie in your team who can actually see this data and use it for themselves. They don't have to come to you anymore. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, we are pretty much done with this example. And just to recap, we built a two-way sync between the database and the sheets. And this was initially how we designed data sync itself. But later on, we decided to add another component, which we call the middle layer, uh, which is using the new API, which is just released early this month. And it allows us to do a lot more operation on Google Sheets itself. The reason we have a central component called the middle layer is because it allows all read and writes to the Google Sheets to be done in one central place. And this allows us to scale easily in the future if need be. If we're handling, say, 100 events in a particular month, we can just increase that size or put it behind a load balancer and not affect any other part of the system. And it also ensures only one point of failure. The second reason we have this is because we can implement a priority scheme. So when the app wants to write to the database, it's instead written to the middle layer first. The middle layer will pick it up. It will write to sheets. And then only upon success will it actually write to the database itself. So this will ensure that data is always consistent across the sheets and the database. So keeping these two in mind, I'm going to show you a working prototype of Jubilee's own data sync itself. Uh, let me jump to my browser. So I have our Jubilee Sense, which I've loaded just for one event. Say, uh, say we're using Jubilee Service to run PyCon Singapore 2017. So the first thing I'm going to show you guys is the different types of people coming down to PyCon. We capture that in our system, which we call the different groups. So let's say there are programmers, there are sponsors, and there are organizers. And the different attributes. This uh, people coming down to PyCon will tell us their position country, and skills, maybe. And all this data is collected on the registration form. So for a different event, we're going to change this data to something else, maybe. Now I'm going to jump to the data sync page itself. You would see a lot of things happening over here, but it's not very clear. Let me just uh, spell it out for you guys. So this is where we can add more emails to share the Google Sheets with someone. 
This is to access the database itself, which I'm going to click now. And while that's opening up, this is the part where you can actually sync. You can sync everything, a particular sheet, or be even more micro by specifying the row itself on which, Google, which rows in the sheet you want to sync. And finally, we have a log here. So this is a fresh event I created. These are the three different groups of people coming down to PyCon. The first four fields you see here are Jubilee specific fields. The next few are basic fields like email, name, company, and so on. And the last few are the ones which I specified as attributes. Attribute country sk and skills, which will be shown over here. So say for example, I'm gonna add some people. Say I'm gonna add my colleague Charles. And I'm going to add Benjamin. And lastly, maybe add myself as one of the sponsors. And that's it. I just have to sync. So let me show you guys how we managed to do only one row sync. I want to sync sponsors row two only. So I can just specify two and sync the corresponding column in sponsors. What's going to happen now is I'm going to insert a new field because this does not have an ID previously. So it's taken as an insert. It generates a unique auto increment ID over here and a passcode for the user. And this passcode is ready to be used for our Jubilee match application itself. We have a web scraper in place as well, which pulls information for the company's URL and description. And if I want to do a sync all, or say, I want to sync all the rows in the programmer sheet to put in my colleagues, Charles and Benjamin. So I simply specify that sheet. And in any minute, I should be getting the IDs. And now the scraper is running. What you see over here is a loading bar, which I'm going to talk more about how we uh, implemented that using server sent events. So the passcode which I got for myself is this one. I can start using this already in my match application. Okay, just choose this for formality sake. And we, I see the two people on the other side who are Charles and Benjamin as programmers. But what I want to show you guys is, what if match writes data to the database? It should be reflected in Google Sheets as well. One such actions which we have is changing the profile. So if I want to add a phone number, for example, I simply, okay. I can simply save it and I think I think my test server is wonking up. <laughs> it was just working before this. But usually, uh, so not usually, it always comes up. But I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, you would see the position, which I saved there, CTO, and, uh, and then the contact number here as well. So it writes to the database and the Google Docs as well. So that's the idea of completing a two-way sync. OK, uh, so that was data sync. Uh, I'm going to jump back to my slides. Uh, and move on to showing you code snippets from the data sync itself. So I'll be showing you a few uh, parts to the code snippets. The first part is helper functions which we have written. It would be like how to initiate the Google service, uh, maybe how do you uh, share emails, uh, share a particular sheet with particular emails. And then I'll move on to the main logic itself, which is data sync. So over here, we have initiating the Google service. It's pretty simple. You get, get credentials from Google. You have to authorize the Google Drive and Google Sheets API. And you don't need to always do an OAuth 2 access token because you can store the refresh token in your own database, which, I, which is what I've done here in credentials. And using the credentials, you can build your service. So every time you call the API, you just have to pick up the service object and 
pass it to the API. To create a sheet, uh, we need to cater for two cases. The first case is creating a fresh sheet, which is what I did in the PyCon example. So we had three groups, meaning three different tabs and two different attributes, the skills and the country, I think. But the second case is updating a sheet. So say, for example, I have to add another group or I have to remove a column which already exists. So both of them can be done. I've taken the example of creating a fresh sheet. What we first do is we add the columns on the top part using the column headers. These are the basic columns. The second part would show the extra columns, which is after I extend the attributes group, which would be all the extra columns I specified. So this would be the top header bar. And the next part over here is the different tabs. So the tabs are referenced by the event participant groups, which would be the three groups we created. And once I call the service spreadsheets collection object using the create function, I'm able to create the sheet which we just saw. So it's pretty simple. The next one is the share sheets with collaborators. Unfortunately, Google Sheets does not provide an API for this. You have to use a Google Drive API. And Google Drive handles credentials a bit differently. So you would see that I'm not using service here. I'm instead using the credentials object. And I'm using uh, the credentials to generate an access token. And once I'm able to do that, I simply populate the shared emails. And through a simple API, which I'm, where I'm passing the access token in the authorization header, I call Google. And the sheet will be shared with those particular emails. And lastly, I just have to add those emails into my database so that I don't have to re-add someone again who's already been shared. The next part is wrapper functions for the API itself. The next part is the wrapper functions for the API. So there are three parts to the Google Sheets API, spreadsheet, spreadsheet collection, and spreadsheet values. The first one you should see is spreadsheet, which will give you properties of the spreadsheet itself, like uh, the spreadsheet name and things like the, how many rows there are inside the spreadsheet. And this would be actually used by the data sync code itself. The second, uh, the second and the third ones are to get a range of cells and to write to a range of cells. So you can specify this using, say, the cell ranges object, uh, so cell ranges, which is a list of lists and you can get all the values corresponding to those lists. And you would get a very simple um, object in response, which you can query using value ranges. The same thing goes for batch update cells. You can specify the range you want to update, and you can update that with the corresponding value in values. The, the name of the variable is values over here. And there's something interesting over here is that both of these functions, the second and the third, don't care about how many rows or cells you want to get or update. If I was getting one single cell compared to getting 100,000 cells, the time taken would be the same. So that's why we actually do a few things at the same time rather than doing one row at a time, which I'm going to show you guys later. I'm not sure why Google did that and how they did that, but that's quite interesting. So this is the sync endpoint itself. So we're using Flask and Flask RESTful in the backend. Uh, we get four parameters from the front end, the event ID, the start row, the end row of the sync, and which group I'm syncing, which is referring to which sheet I'm syncing. I can, of course, sync all, and I just go slowly across all the sheets. And the class over here, you will notice, follows a try, accept, else pattern. So the try itself uh, calls the main function to sync, which itself is a generator object. The accept over here, uh, sometimes Google returns us errors, and we don't want to stop the user from syncing when the error happens. So what we do is we capture the error, and we know where it failed last, because we actually store where every time it does a successful sync. And we store this in a NoSQL database, which Amazon provides us, which is called Dynamo. I will be talking more about that as well. But that's the reason over here we are able to jump back to the, to the row where it failed and start syncing again. Usually Google times out. And the last part is the part where it's successful and we want to write the successful status inside the Dynamo database and report that to the front end in the loading bar, which I showed you guys earlier. 
So this is just for syncing a spreadsheet. We have a similar structure for scraping and running other scripts as well, but I'm not showing that here. So this is the generator function itself. It constitutes majority of the data sync logic itself. It's pretty simple to follow, but I've abstracted out a lot of things. Uh, let's start out by looking at the first part, which is uh, where we define all the attributes. And these are put inside the headers. Then we call the Google API to initiate login to it. And then we retrieve relevant properties from the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet ID, the sheet properties, and so on. And we set the block size to 10. So over here, just for simplicity's sake, I'm just syncing 10 rows at a time. If you want, you can be syncing 100 rows at a time, and you will achieve the same speed as well. And then we calculate how many chunks there are. A chunk comprises of 10 rows. If there are 105 rows, there'll be 11 chunks. And the last chunk count would refer to five, because you have 105 rows. And we do a bit more simple math. And finally, we start looping for every chunk. The important thing to note here is cell range, which Google requires everything in the A1 notation. So you have to specify the sheet you want to change, followed by a semicolon and the cell range itself, like A2 to B5. And then we get all the cells we want to sync, which is in the response object. And we iterate over this response object to put it in a data structure we're familiar with, which is a dictionary, which is data struct. And data struct <coughs> itself is passed to the middle layer, the part which handles all the read and writes to the Google Sheets. So middle layer is not only doing uh, the read and write for data sync, which is this code snippet, it does for a lot of other codes as well. And the part which passes to the middle layer is here, the last line, which is process data, we pass in the data struct, and we pass in the Google service object, so that the middle layer does not have to regenerate it every time it's called. Okay. Uh, over here, uh, we are, if, if we basically calculate the percentage of how much it has been synced, and we report this back to the front end. And the last part here is we increment the start range and the end range after we complete one successful sync so that we can move on to the next chunk. Uh, just know one thing over here, we're yielding the report dictionary because I mentioned this function itself is a generator. I hope you guys are familiar with generators and the reason we are using a generator itself is because it uh, saves memory. Uh, memory consumption is way lower and especially it becomes very useful when we're dealing with large events like 50,000 people in just one sheet how do you open all of that in your RAM? That's not possible. So Python becomes very useful in terms of generators. And this is the middle layer code itself. In the middle layer, we get the a dictionary. And there are three cases we cater for over here. The first case is add. So if the row does not exist inside the database itself, we simply add it to the database and using the add new attendee function. And we get back the ID and the passcode of the pa people we have added. And these values are appended to the update role list, which you guys, which you can see over there. And this is finally written back to the Google Docs after a chunk has been synced. So if there are 10 new inserts, after we sync one chunk, you'll be writing back the IDs and passcodes of those 10 people back to the database like you guys saw inside the demo. The second case is delete. When you want to delete a person, we simply have to remove him from the database, and we have to uh, remove their requests and meetings they have done on match. And the last case is update, which is actually the simplest. We take the values corresponding to that ID, and we simply update those values inside the database. And uh, the if sentence is here. If there were new people added, we have to update it back to the database. So the last part is how do we show these uh, on the front end itself, the loading bar which you guys saw. So I quickly mentioned, I briefly mentioned about it. It's uh, done using Dynamo database. So it's a DB centric model. Our send server, the one which actually calls the Google Docs is uh, calling a server on the private subnet because it's handling data. So we keep it on the private subnet which actually does the data sync. 
And upon every successful sync, we yield the values to Dynamo database. And once this is done, Sense would pull those values from Dynamo and report it to the front end. And if we do this on every one second interval, we are able to establish a continuous syncing bar. So it's very easy to do that. We have a function which I can quickly show you guys. Once you push a report dictionary to this function, which would be what you want to put inside Dynamo, you simply have to query which row inside Dynamo you have to insert it in. Since it's a NoSQL object, there is no structure. Uh, we simply add it to an event ID key inside the database. And Sense would then take it up from there. OK, that's about it. Uh, let me conclude. Uh, so we saw how Google Sheets is an alternative representation to your database itself. And it allows everyone in the team, be it programmers or non-techies, to use your database and learn insights from it. So the idea is to let the data work for you and not the other way around. The second is we, use, we can use Google for internal data management and analysis. So since we all are working in companies with maybe large data sets of information, you should probably talk with other teams to find out what data you can put inside Google Sheets because you don't want to put everything there as well. You should consider putting values which are dynamic in nature and which your teams actually want to track but are unable to do so because they don't have a visualization tool for it or they don't have access to the database. And there are some applications like ours which is client facing where our clients can go and use Google Sheets without messing up our database itself. So you can think about how you can implement such a function in your own company as well. Okay, I'm gonna leave you guys with this quote. Um, make sure that you're not caught uh, in capturing unwanted data because you're gonna be spending so much time cleaning, processing, and structuring that in the future. So Google Sheets would be a good solution to a problem like this. Thank you. Questions? Okay, so we're pretty much uh, rooted into the Amazon stack because everything is on there right now. We did give MongoDB a try, but we thought that uh, Amazon, Amazon's Dynamo pretty much does the job well, and it's much more simpler as well. We don't have to create a MongoDB on an EC2 server in Amazon. So that's the reason we decided to do, uh, give Dynamo a shot. So uh, if you guys, if you remember the first column I created, synced and not synced, you are able to call an API when an edit is triggered. But I have not done that because it can be a bit costly. Every time an edit is triggered, it'll call, it'll fire the API. Instead, what we do is we collate all the changes and we push it to the back end. So what you are saying is possible, but it's not possible via the Google Sheets API. It's possible via the Google Apps script trigger. Yeah, so it's a completely separate thing, but it's possible. Anyone else? Uh, if I'm not wrong, you're not able to, so the API allows you to freeze it, but once you freeze it, you're not able to edit it, if I'm not wrong. Even why the so your own function is not able to edit it because the freeze would be permanent for all users. So they don't have uh, granular permissions yet for this. Okay, yeah. I think that. Yes, that happens. So we do have a. Uh, so when we pass on, when we get a new event and when we want to teach them data sync, we do tell them that don't touch this. So yeah, it's a bit manual, but.
Okay then, thank you guys.